So I'm here with Aduco trainer Richard Young, and today we're going to talk a little bit about usability for medical devices. So a first question for you, Richard, then is, um, we, we, well, we're seeing as a company a lot more interest and um, in, in usability and around that area for medical devices. So I think my first question then is really what's happened, what's changed, um, why are why are we seeing a greater interest and in, in spike in um, in usability inquiries? Yeah, we certainly are, and we're certainly seeing it out there from a regulatory perspective. I, I think usability engineering as a discipline, usability or human factors engineering, has always been a discipline that's out there, and it's certainly the interest in it as a sort of a state of the art process has developed really over the sort of the last ten or fifteen years. Um, what we're finding now is as we especially in Europe get into the new regulations we're we're seeing a different emphasis on it because it's seen as an important part of meeting the general safety and performance requirements uh, under the uh, both the in vitro diagnostics and medical devices regulations so it's the the, the profile of it's really raised uh, and I think that's partly because of the new regulations uh, and partly sort of maybe as an unintended consequence of you know changes to the general safety of performance requirements especially looking at the intended use and use environment of our of our products uh, and the realization that uh, a lot of medical procedures have moved out of a strictly clinical environment to a home environment where you know, a lot of care is being delivered by home by you know family and loved ones and that really changes you know how you communicate how to use products to to your your target audience they, they they're very different uh, and that's driven a lot of thinking and and you know, requirement in this area as we've gone forwards Thank you for that, Richard. Um, next question then is how can organisations approach human factors um, engineering and, and usability for devices? Is it something they've got to th think about early on in development and um, and what to do? What, what do they need to do about legacy products? OK, so dealing with the first bit there. Yes, it's something that we need to deal, deal with as part of the development process. Uh, what we're seeing at the moment is uh, a lot of problems uh products out there where the design history of their development is is quite old uh, and maybe needs some updating uh, and as part of that process of refreshing the design history of, of legacy products we certainly the the requirement to consider usability comes in where it maybe hadn't come in before so that's really driving the demand for understanding and resource to to pile in to do that i'll go back to legacy in a minute so but we we see this increasing demand it is a requirement uh and really europe really in synchronizing with america has you know the absence of this state-of-the-art approach uh, has become a refusal to accept regulatory submissions now, the main standard we use for this uh, it, from an international uh, standard is, is a document or two documents called IEC 62366, which comes in two parts, part one and two, uh, which were released in 2015. And they ask us to have a, uh, a process that begins at the beginning of the development of the product uh, and runs through the development lifecycle, the procedure in working very closely with the risk management process as well to try and bake uh, usability, there's ergonomic factors and these human factors considerations into the design requirements at the beginning and then throughout the, the progression of the design. Uh, and as that goes forwards, we have various uh, verification uh, and validation steps that the standard asks us to do to verify that we've got the right that those human interfaces those usability factors have been considered and addressed in the design uh, and that's usually through um, a, a series of experiments uh, formative ones to form our response and then summative experiments at the conclusion of the design process to really do the design verification of the usability elements there 
for legacy products, it, it can be easier and possibly more complicated. Because I'm sure a lot of the audience out there have got leg legacy products out there. Um, and the standard gives us two possible approaches. Now, assuming nothing's changed about the product and we have a pretty stable uh, uh, user interface and, and a series of instructions that support it, uh, we are allowed by the standard to treat the user interface as uh, a user interface of unknown pedigree and, and document a review of that. Uh, and that is deemed sufficient in a lot of cases, as long as we can sort of demonstrate that continuity of, of that user interface in the in in the use in, the, in clinic or wherever it's being used. Uh, where that falls over, as, as we're, re, re, especially from a European perspective, as we're generating this data to comply with the medical devices regulation or with the in vitro diagnostics regulation, uh, we, we find that the use environment or the intended user or the intended use of the product has, has subtly shifted over the lifetime of the product. And that hasn't necessarily been reflected in the uh, the content of the data that we can possibly refer to and, and work with, it needs to be updated to address this. Uh, and in that case, we're really forced into some element of repeating the design process, incorporating the, these usability requirements in there to, to give us uh, the result we need to be successful in uh, submissions to notified bodies for, for the conformity assessment process. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, my next question then actually is, uh, we've mentioned the US as well, but is this something that's only applicable to those with, who are selling their products in, in Europe? Or is it a sort of a global um, requirement that's, that, they must, that, that manufacturers must follow? It, for the most of the uh, world's markets, uh, it's a growing global requirement. Certainly, uh, for the European and for the US markets, the the value of of this approach and integrating into and baking into the design process uh, is very much recognised. Um, uh, FDA have had some very good guidance uh, out there that's freely available at fda.gov. Um, if you search for human factors engineering, there's a guidance document there that that is excellent, which explains exactly what the FDA want to see and the terminology, more importantly, that they want you to use uh, in these uh, in documenting your approach for that market. Um, languages that usually the, divide, the dividing factor, not the intent. Um, and FDA have really ratcheted that up over the last uh, decade or so where really now uh, the, 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 pre the absence of this usability data or reports to support this, this process has been applied uh, would result in what uh, the FDA call uh, a refusal to accept, uh, which is where the FDA would stop reviewing a submission uh, and send it back to the manufacturer or, or legal representative and suggest that you know, give it another go and... Um, uh, and, and see if we can do better next time. So, it, you know, from a timeline perspective, the failure to include this thing can have some fairly fairly dire consequences uh, for timelines and costs. Uh, so we want to get it, if we want to get it right uh, first time, we've really got to consider these things and make sure we have sufficient documentation to demonstrate compliance with the standard. Thanks, Richard. And... Um... Another question I've got here then about uh, human factors engineering and usability for, for devices is um, I'm aware, obviously, that studies are conducted in, in this field. And is it something that's needed by all manufacturers for all devices? Is a study required? Do they need to gather their own data? Um, yeah, for, around usability. Yeah, um, as each device uh, is has its own foibles and elements of uniqueness i guess what we're what we're faced with is yeah we unless we can make a, a case to suggest that the user interfaces you know hasn't changed and, and can be seen as one of unknown pedigree that's worked historically unless we can document that out um and that's possible yeah we're really stuck into actually having to go and generate this this design verification data 
to allow us to meet our regulatory requirements, you know, to you know be able to put a tick in that box. Um, in some cases, the value of that is is maybe marginal, but it is something that needs to be done to to be fully compliant with the general safety and performance requirements. So yes, unfortunately, most manufacturers are going to have to do, they're going to have to have some bit of paper whether it be this uh, assessment of, uh, of the interface uh, from a viewpoint of unknown pedigree or uh, formal protocols and reports using focus groups or or, or, or uh, clinical expertise to look at these factors and, and, uh, and, and qualify them for the field. So the only thing I'd suggest to, to use uh, to companies is make sure you know the value of understanding the standards and the requirements here is in allowing you to do something that meets the requirements and is proportionate to the risk classification of your product um, and and is focused and, and on target and, and provides where wherever possible uh, you know value for money um, with regards to taking that product forward and maintaining its conformity assessment.